Hello, and welcome to today's interview. My name is Nick, Nick Deal, and I've been working at Bond Solon training expert witnesses for the last seven or eight years. Today's interview arises out of a case that collapsed uh, in the criminal courts uh, a couple of weeks ago, where an expert witness who had been instructed by the prosecution uh, was eventually abandoned by the prosecution as not being a reliable witness for their case. What we wanted to do today was to find a bit more about the background to that and what the implications are for other expert witnesses, not just in criminal cases, but in family and civil cases as well. And I'm delighted that we're joined today by Narita Barra, QC. Hi, Nick. Who was the lead uh, barrister for the first defendant, I think, in the, in the case. Correct. So, Narita, thank you for joining us today. Could you start off very briefly by outlining what the case was for the prosecution against the defendants? So the case involved eight defendants and it was a uh, conspiracy to defraud, uh, carbon credits and diamonds and the prosecution case was that uh, in relation to the carbon credits that based on expert evidence there was no room in the market for anyone to sell VERs in a secondary market and therefore no room for brokers to be operating within that market. So the Economic Crime Department of the City of London Police then rounded up anyone who was selling high-risk carbon credit VERs in brokerages and said that they were all guilty of this carbon credit fraud. And the defence case in outline was what? The defence case was that there was a secondary market for carbon credits, there was a legitimate room for brokers to be operating in that market and that they were selling carbon credits for suppliers in that market. And I think in the case in which you represented the first defendant, there were eight defendants in total? That's correct. Okay. Uh, the issues sound quite niche. Uh, in terms of what, what the case was for the prosecution. Was there a need here for expert witnesses? Uh, the prosecution conceded at the outset when I made an application to exclude the prosecution expert that without the expert they would not have a case on the carbon credit counts. Right, so the expert evidence goes right to the heart of that, of that part of the case. Yes, because the expert was saying that there was no room to sell these particular types of carbon credits called VERs in the market. And if there was no room for that, there was no secondary market, then there would obviously be no room for brokers. So the fact that they were brokers meant they were guilty. By definition. Yeah. All right. Um, who was the prosecution expert? Who did they instruct? The prosecution instructed a gentleman called Mr Andrew Agar and um, he was used not just in this case, but in all the carbon credit fraud trials that the prosecution undertook. There was one other expert who he seemed to be working closely with, um, but dependent on cross-examination and where Mr. Agar was asked to give evidence, somewhere between 20 and 50 cases in which he gave evidence or was involved in the investigation and each case would have had somewhere between eight to ten defendants. And this was all prior to the trial in which you... This was the last trial that Mr Agar was going to be involved in because the prosecution have conceded they will never use him again. And did you uh, instruct an expert witness as well? We did, and that was quite difficult because um, carbon credits, as you say, is a very niche market. Um, and we looked around and I conducted my own research and I found someone who had worked in the markets, also had academic experience in the markets, and had written a book called Carbon Credit and Fraud. Right, so you instructed that expert, and who, who was that? So I instructed an expert called Dr. Marius Frunzer, who had worked in the, um, as a broker. Uh, he was an academic, he had a PhD in carbon credits, um, he'd given evidence in other countries, America and France. He'd given evidence in civil courts, but never in a criminal court in the UK. Now, Narita, I mentioned in my introduction that the, the, the case collapsed. Can you just take us to what triggered that collapse and what, what first got you on to that there, the, there was an issue with uh, Mr Agar? So, um, we, we, the defence, once we'd instructed Dr Brunzer, and we had our report. We notified the court that we're going to be relying upon him. 
I asked the judge to activate the criminal procedure rules to instruct the experts to have a joint meeting to identify the issues that they agreed upon and the issues that remained in dispute so we knew as advocates in the trial what we needed to concentrate and focus upon. The judge made the direction and Mr Agar for the prosecution decided that he would like to conduct that joint meeting via telephone conference. Um, Dr Frunza agreed and applying the criminal procedure rules he is bound to keep a record in some way of what was being said so that he can accurately reflect that later on in his notes. Um, he chose to do that by recording the conversation and unfortunately for Mr Agar he didn't tell Mr Agar that he'd recorded it. So at the conclusion of the joint meeting which lasted three hours and 19, min three hours and 19 minutes he phoned me and said that he was very concerned about some of the things that had been said to him off the record. Um, I established that there was a recording, we got a transcript, and as a result of the transcript, I then made an application at the outset for the prosecution to abandon Mr Agar. And I, and I think there were a number of applications that you made before, in fact, that was... No, that was the first into. one. Yeah. That was yeah. the first one, and the prosecution said... Um, they didn't have a case without Mr Agar on the carbon credits, therefore they'd reviewed their position and they were going to carry on regardless. Um, the judge wanted to get on with the trial, so we started the trial, and that was the first of four applications that I made at different stages in the proceedings. And by the time we got to the fourth, the judge had realised that there was a problem, and he then said that we would... Um, asked Mr Agar some questions in the absence of the jury, which is called a voir dire. Okay. Um, and if the judge was satisfied that he had answered those questions properly, then he would be allowed to give evidence before the jury. And if there were any issues, the judge could then hear our submissions about excluding his evidence. All right. So let, let's cut forward then to, to that hearing um, and, and the questions that you put to uh, Mr Agar. And I think I'd like you to sort of go through what issues emerged in terms of his qualifications as an expert and some of his conduct as an expert witness. I think those are broadly the two areas that were, you were criticising. So um, it, it transpired that he had no academic qualifications at all. Um, he couldn't recall um, if out of the three A-levels he sat, if he passed any of them. He had no further qualifications at all, which in of itself, as you know, for an expert is not an issue. He said he had the experiential experience and experience of life because he'd worked as a trader in the markets. Uh, according to his CV, he'd stopped working in the markets in 2015 and we were in 2019 and his uh, CV was absent as to what he'd been doing for four years. Transpired that that was deliberately absent because if he'd put what he had been doing, the prosecution probably wouldn't have relied upon him. Um, and most importantly, it transpired that he hadn't undertaken in that period of time from 2011 when he was first instructed to 2019 any form of training, any form of uh, continuing professional development, any form of reading. Um, and he hadn't even bothered to do some research on his opponent. And th th I think there was an issue about you know, w what literature is available in that particular field of expertise, the carbon credits yes. trading. Yes, and his answer was, I don't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. About. And then when I pointed out to him that Dr Frunza had written a book on carbon credits, he said, yes, I'm aware of that. And we asked him if he'd read it, either previously in the course of his continuing professional development, but more importantly, as soon as he realised that Dr Frunza would be his opponent in, in the trial. And he said no. What would you expect an expert, in, in terms of their own qualifications, would you be happy with an expert who didn't have academic qualifications but had relevant experience, depending on the particular field they're well, I think, putting forward? Yes, depending on the field that, that, that we're putting forward, some of them are so niche and specialist that someone may not have a very established academic background, but they may have very good credentials of working in the environment. But once you decide you're going to be an expert, then you have to appreciate the, the duties your duties to the court, that you have certain guidance that you need to follow, 
um, and you need to be up to speed on what that is and what your duties are. So in the criminal courts, that I, when I instruct an expert and they haven't given evidence in a criminal court before, I provide them with a copy of the criminal procedure rules, part 19, which sets out expert rules and how they should conduct themselves in the trial and what's expected of them. Um, I give them, even if they are a defence expert, um, I give them a copy of the Association of Police Officers um, uh, expert witness guidance because that just gives them an idea of what would be expected of them if they were giving evidence for the prosecution. And I also give them a copy of um, the CPS guidance um, on expert witnesses. And again, at the back of that guidance, it's very helpful because there are some appendices. One is a certificate of instruction, which sets out the day you were instructed and what you were asked to do. Uh, one is a certificate of self-declaration, so when you've given the final expert report over, you, you sign, a, sign a checklist and you know if you haven't got all got ticks in the boxes, you haven't done everything you should be doing. And thirdly, there is a pro forma for a schedule of unused material. So what I would suggest is that any expert keeps their own schedule of unused material. So if and when you're asked by any side to amend a report or delete an appendices, you can then put in your report to say, actually, I, did, I, I prepared this report, but they asked me to change it to this. That way you can never be criticised. Yeah, so you're tracking the whole process yes. through. Um, that's looking at, the, at his expertise and starting to look at his familiarity with the role of the expert. What, what specific things emerged in that hearing about what he had done and shouldn't have done or, and what he did do and shouldn't have done? Well, in relation to all of the guidance, he said he was aware of it, but he mm. then accepted that he'd done none of it. So, so right. absolutely nothing. So, um, in relation to the criminal procedure rules, he said he knew about them, but it was clear he hadn't followed any of them. But more importantly, he had no certificate of self-instruction, so we didn't know what day he'd been instructed, what the criteria was of what he'd been instructed about. Um, he'd not been keeping a record of unused material, he'd not kept a separate file. He said that he had kept his paperwork in a cupboard under the stairs, which breaches all sorts of GDPR rules. Mm. Um, there'd been a flood, so he'd lost it. He now kept all the material in a box on the balcony, again, just completely unsatisfactory. Um, and he'd not been at any stage checking in with the officer in the case who was conducting the investigation or with the CPS lawyer. He said he spoke to the, a lawyer, well his only contact with a lawyer was a week before the trial started and then he never actually made the contact. Right, so he had a Missed contact. Missed call. Right, but no After actual voice contact. Left voicemail, no. All right. In the light of all of that, and, and, it, and it sounds incredible that, that it could have got to that stage, how was it that he could have been appointed as an expert witness without having some relevant knowledge uh, in, in the field and without having really any idea of what he was supposed to do as an expert witness? I think the real difficulty was that he, the, um, he was instructed by the City of London Police and they have, as do all police officers, their own NCA um, list of approved um, experts. And it's quite interesting to see that there was, that these experts were trying to, not just this one, but the other expert in our trial, had a, had a, um, a on the bottom of his email said, 90% of my work is by recommendation, do recommend me. So he was working on the basis of recommendations and it's clear that the officers all decided to use him and then he suddenly became an expert for the economic crime department. And so they all started to use him. They were all using him at the same time because this was all being investigated at the same time. So he had somewhere between 20 and 50 investigations all relying on this man. And he also accepted that the officers didn't have a clue. So one of the officers had an e sent an email saying, just come into this case, very fresh, don't know anything about carbon credits, done a little bit of research on Wikipedia. And Mr. Agar then accepted that he was leading the investigations as opposed to being 
um, ask questions by the officers. So, so Mr. Mr. Agar's view was that he was leading the He accepted the investigation. that eventually that he'd been leading the investigations. He'd been cutting and pasting statements, which simply said, um, Officer X asked me this question. And then he would insert the name of the officer. And in fact, had that officer asked him that question? No. Now this is really very serious. I mean, it's, it, we, we smile about it because it seems so ludicrous that it could actually occur, but this is extremely serious, isn't it? Yes. Um, because the repercussions for the, the justice system are huge. Yes, financially, um, justice, people's lives have been ruined. It's quite shocking. The information that you've described to us was there for the, for the discovering, wasn't it? I mean, yes. Anybody who had properly looked into his background could have found out those details and prevented him acting as an expert witness, prevented that instruction. Yes. That in itself is another serious matter. That there seems to be no oversight in, in the instruction process in the first place. No, I completely agree. So the, the position is that, that in, in frauds of this nature, the Crown Prosecution Service don't get involved until the officers feel they have sufficient material to go to the Crown Prosecution Service to say they're going to charge. So for many, many years in this case, um, the police were being led by Mr Agar and there was evidence to support that. And so the police and Mr Agar were liaising with each other. Um, and Mr Agar didn't have an understanding of what his duties were as an expert to record, retain and reveal. Mm. The police officer clearly had not dealt with an expert witness and didn't understand that as a disclosure officer he should be ensuring that his witness was recording, mm. retaining and revealing. Um, and then by that stage a Crown Prosecution lawyer comes in, many years have passed and Maybe it's underfunding. In our case, we had a change of two lawyers, but nobody thought to go back and check that process. And what's quite interesting is from the defence side as well, I mean, the, this was one of the last carbon credit, credit frauds to be prosecuted. Um, many have been prosecuted before us that nobody had chosen to check that the expert had complied with their disclosure obligations. Right. And also, presumably, to, to instruct an expert on the other side to see if there was a challenge to their expertise, to their yes. view of the expert issues. Yes. Um, I'm, I am aware that um, some experts were instructed by the defence, but I think the position was that they may not have been, when, when experiential experience was looked at, they may not have had as much experience as Mr Agar had. And, and therefore wouldn't have stood up? No, that they wouldn't him. have been able to yes. challenge him in the way that somebody who had the academic background, who had a PhD, who'd written a book on carbon credit fraud, would have. Now, um, there's massive implications in, in the criminal justice system. Just two, two last things, really. What about the role of an expert witness? So plainly, they have to have relevant expertise in yes. the area, whether that comes through qualifications or experience or a combination of the two. That's an essential. What's your view about a, a, an expert witness and needing to be trained in how to be an expert witness, how, what their duties are and what they should do? I think it's absolutely crucial because what became, what became clear over the course of the two days of cross-examination was that Mr Agar had no understanding at all that his duty was to the court. And he, he kept saying he knew that, but he didn't actually appreciate what that meant. Um, and I think training is key because if, if you're not trained, then you, you, don't, you don't appreciate what that actually means. And more importantly, I think anybody who's acting as an expert witness has a duty to protect themselves as well so that they know that everything they are doing is in accordance with procedure, guidelines, and that they are not ever in a position that Mr. Agar found himself in. Um, so, you know, whether you give evidence in a civil court or a criminal court, I, I think the key is to know the rules. So if you're being instructed by a party, you, you should make sure that you've got either the civil procedure rules or the criminal procedure rules that relate to experts. You should then ask whoever is instructing you whether or not there's specific guidance, whether it's on your side or the other side, that they will be following. Um, and what, I've, what I think is actually very helpful is if you go to the back of the Crown, um, the Crown Prosecution Expert Guidance, they've actually got um, 
appendices with drafts of different types of certificates and unused material schedules and so on that you can you can use as templates um, and if you just make that good practice then at least you would never be in that position because there yes. was in our case there was another witness and we never quite got round to this who'd given evidence but um, there were this, we found some evidence that the officer had been asking him to delete parts of his reports and appendices. Now the difficulty is in the absence of keeping unused material and copies of those reports or documents, nobody knew what had actually been deleted or not. But we never got round to that because we, the trial stopped at Mr. Agar. Right, right. You, plainly this was a, a, a criminal justice case. Um, you've, you've mentioned the, the sort of repercussions possibly in, in civil matters and in, and in family trials as well. In your view, does this does this case, does this need for training as an expert witness go beyond the criminal justice system? Does it, does it feed into what's going on in the civil justice system and the family justice Absolutely. system? Absolutely. It, it's, it's all the same. Anybody who gives evidence in any courtroom um, needs to, in my view, ensure that their duty is to the court and that they have complied with whatever rules apply in that specific court so that they can't be criticised because what becomes clear in the criminal justice system is the underfunding is what causes the problem. So maybe in the civil courts, um, people are much more um, on the ball. You have two sides that are funding it. They understand that if it goes wrong, they are going to have to bear the costs of it. And so there's much more scrutiny going on in, in, in other court centres where matters are being privately funded. But as an expert, I don't think one should rely upon other people to police you. Right, so there's actually a, a, a self-responsibility there for the expert witness to... Well, to I think to it goes down to building a reputation and retaining your credibility. Mm. If you self-police, you make sure that you're trained, um, you make sure that you have a procedure that complies with whichever court centre you're in. And if you're giving evidence for what, for, for, by way of example, Dr Frunzer in our trial had never given evidence in a criminal court, so he was aware of the civil procedure rules. Um, we then armed him with the material he needed to know what his duties were. But not every defence team will do that. Not every um, person who instructs you will do that. So you as an expert should know what you should be asking. Yes. Narita, thank you very much for coming in today and, and giving us the benefit of your obvious inside knowledge of the case and also thinking about, with us about the implications of that for expert witnesses. Thank you for having me, Nick. Thank you. So there we have it, the, the obvious need for the expert witness not only to make sure they have relevant qualifications, if there are any, in their particular field and certainly relevant experience in their field, but also to make themselves familiar with the relevant rules in the particular courts that they're appearing in. And not just reading those rules, but really understanding what the implications of the applications of those rules will be. Thank you for watching.